All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, and I'm just delighted that he agreed to this interview. It, it's about a subject that I kept coming across in kind of some of my recent interviews uh, in regards to K the book Chaos and also Linda Peace's book about Robert F. Kennedy. And this interesting kind of secretive char character's name was James Jesus Angleton. The title of his book is The Ghost, The Secret Life of CIA Spy Master James Jesus Angleton. The author's name is Jefferson Morley. He's also written other books, uh, Our Man in Mexico, Winston Scott, and The Hidden History of the CIA, and also Snowstorm in August, Washington City, Francis Scott Key, and The Forgotten Race Riot of 1835. Uh, but this is a great book. I finished it yesterday. And he's also the editor of the blog, JFK Facts. He's been involved in a lawsuit with the CIA for certain records associated to the Kennedy assassination. And it seems like it's 16 years now or 14 years. So it's Morley. His last name is spelled Morley, M-O-R-L-E-Y, the CIA, still active in federal court. And it was interesting when I was reading the intro to his book, you know, I didn't really have a, uh, something to describe James Jesus Angleton, but he uses the phrase spectral glimpses. And that's what uh, I had before I read this book. So this book really uh, was terrific in showing all these details about his life. But uh, I'll let him talk more about it. Jefferson, are you there? Yes, I am. Awesome. Thank you, William. Awesome. Well, thank you. It's really great to uh, talk with you about this subject. For people who don't know your name, can you talk a little bit about yourself and how you became interest in, interested in the subject of James Jesus Angleton? So uh, my name's uh, Jefferson Morley. I've been a journalist in Washington for the last uh, 35 years, since the mid-1980s. Um, worked for a variety of national publications, The Nation, The New Republic, uh, Salon, but uh, also spent 15 years as an editor and a reporter at the Washington Post. Um, when I was just starting my career as a young journalist in Washington in the 1980s, the hottest story of the day were the civil wars of Central America and the U.S. intervention there by the Reagan administration. This was a very hot issue. And as I was covering that issue, it became very apparent to me that you couldn't understand the issue without understanding the role of the CIA um, and when the Iran-Contra scandal broke out in 19, uh, at the end of 1986, uh, um, uh, that was proven. The CIA role was much greater uh, or was revealed to be much greater than had ever been known publicly, although reporters working on the story understood that there was a lot happening. So that was, that's where I got my interest in the CIA. Um, it wasn't until uh, the 19, early 1990s that I attach that interest in the CIA to the JFK assassination. And what happened in 1992 was Congress passed the JFK Records Act uh, in response to Oliver Stone's movie, and the, the, the law sought to quell the controversy around the movie by releasing all of the government's records. And so in mid-1990s, from 1994 to 1998, a huge body of new records came into public view um, related to the Kennedy assassination. And many of them, thousands of them, literally thousands of them, were CIA documents. And so my longstanding interest in the role of the CIA in foreign policy now had this historical foundation of what the CIA was doing in the early 1960s at the time of the Kennedy assassination. And um, I wasn't, I didn't have any particular theory of the assassination. I'm a, I'm a working journalist, so I don't report theories. I report facts. Um, uh, and this new body of records provided a tremendous new understanding of new detail about CIA operations in the 1960s. So um, rather than write a book about JFK, I decided to write a book about what the Kennedy assassination looked like to people inside the CIA. And my thinking was that who cares what Morley's theory of the CIA is? I was in kindergarten at the time. You know, I didn't have any claim to have a JFK theory. But what senior CIA officials thought of JFK, now that, that was a very interesting subject to me. And that became the subject of my first book, Our Man in Mexico, 
which is a biography of a man named Wynne Scott. And Wynne Scott was the chief of the CIA station in Mexico City in 1963. So he had a front row seat, as it were, on the assassination story, because, of course, the assassin Lee Harvey Oswald had passed through there. Um, so that was my first book and gave me a, a very close, um, and that book, Our Man in Mexico, uh, still in print, um, is um, a very close look at the founding generation of the CIA, the CIA in its first 25 years. Wynne Scott was not one of the most famous men there, but within the CIA, he was extremely highly regarded. He was one of, considered one of the best officers in the clandestine service. So um, uh, that was um, what, you know, my, my initial foray into the CIA. Um, and then while I was doing that, I was also interested in pursuing more about the Kennedy assassination. And as you said at the top of the show, I filed a lawsuit for certain JFK records in 2003, um, which dragged on and um, has recently concluded, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. But I want to come back um, and explain my second book about the okay. CIA, which was about James Angleton. James Angleton was the counterintelligence chief of the CIA. He was good friends with Wynne Scott. They had both been in the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. They had both entered the CIA um, from the day it was founded in September 1947, and they were friends for much of their lives, although at the end of their lives, their friendship soured. But um, after writing the book about Wynne Scott, I thought a book about Angleton would be a nice companion. Wynne Scott was a very successful CIA field officer. He was a chief of station. He was out in the world in Mexico City. Um, uh, James Angleton was a different type of power within the CIA. He never went out to a CIA station out in the world. He was always at headquarters. And so I wrote a, The Ghost, my biography of Angleton, to kind of fill out the picture of the CIA in these first 25 years. In particular, what, you know, what did the founding, these founding personalities, and Wynne Scott and James Angleton were two of the most important ones, you know, what were their careers like? What did they think? How did they view the world? What did they do? And as with Wynne Scott, Angleton's story coincided with the JFK assassination story, albeit in a different way. Angleton, as the chief of counterintelligence, had opened the CIA's first file on Oswald in November 1959 after he defected to the Soviet Union. So Angleton's story as well provides a front page or, you know, front row seat into the JFK story. And like I said before, it's not this isn't Morley's theory. It's not anybody's theory. It's it's what Angleton said and did based on uh, the JFK records that have been released in the last 10 or 15 years and interviews with a couple, three dozen retired CIA officers or CIA assets who knew him. So it's a very granular look at the events of 1963 and Angleton's very curious and I would say suspicious role in them. And so uh, there's a lot more in the book than JFK. Uh, Angleton had a very consequential career. He was he was one of the two or three most important CIA officials in the first 25 years of its existence. Really only Alan Dulles and Richard Helms uh, can be compared to him in terms of their power and influence within the agency. So an incredibly poor, important personality um, who had his fingers in lots of things, um, mass surveillance of uh, political dissidents. Angleton was a leader in that, um, uh, reading people's mail, right. spying on the anti-war movement, uh, MK Ultra, the mind control experiment program Angleton had a founding role in. So uh, Angleton's a very important personality in the history of the CIA and the ghost. Um, which I should say is uh, available on my own personal website. If you don't want to pay your money to Amazon, uh, you can go to Jefferson Morley Books and um, uh, order a copy, uh, and I'd be glad to sign it for you. Great. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a really um, you know new and important look at Angleton. There have been other good Angleton books written, um, which I used in the course of writing my book, but those books are pretty old now. 
Um, and uh, a lot, two of the best were written in the early 1990s, even before the Cold War had really ended. Right. And yours was you, sorry uh, to interrupt, but yours was uh, published October 24th, 2017. Just for correct. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to tap into all of that information that had been released um, um, in the 1990s um, after the after JFK the movie. So. And there was a lot of Angleton material in there. And so I was able to incorporate and give a much fuller picture of, um, of Angleton's role. And, and one of the revelations, one of the things that distinguishes my book from those earlier books was Angleton was involved in much, a much wider range of CIA activities than was generally known. And my book gets into some of those. For example, the... Uh, um, Israel's efforts to um, obtain fissile material from the United States to create its first atom bomb. Angleton had very close relations with the leaders of Israeli intelligence services, and um, he was uh, instrumental, I think, in helping Israel uh, get the bomb uh, in 1969, 1970. So right. that just gives you a, a, a sense of the scope of the man's career, the, the, the different type of operations that he was involved in yeah i mean i thought it was fascinating how that's how you ended the book was uh, a placard of james jesus angleton in down in jerusalem looking over the old city a place where he used to go it was an interesting revealing aspect of the book that i was uh you know, yeah didn't and, know and about. the angleton memorial the angleton memorial in jerusalem is still maintained by former Mossad officers which is an indication of how much they admired him and appreciated him. To this day, um, they will visit there once a year uh, and commemorate him and toast him. So uh, Angleton's friendship with the Israeli uh, intelligence service is very important. Yeah, he had a, he had a very uh, close relationship and was sharing information. And also, I think he saw, you said he celebrated his 50th birthday there in Israel. With uh, I mean, that's how close his, his yes. contacts with them was. And it's, I also found it interesting in your book how you a lot of these names that you mentioned earlier were people who went right into training with them, names that other people know. And one you mentioned was Helms, Colby, who became kind of his antagonist, uh, Winston Scott, and then George White as well. I didn't know that he had a yeah. uh, connection to this guy who was involved in dosing people on the West Coast in Operation Midnight Climax. So th there's a lot of really amazing facts in your book. Yeah, we. Uh, I think that you touch on something important there, which is when when the CIA was was first getting involved in what came to be called uh, the shorthand mind control. Um, uh, uh, um, Angleton was one of the senior officials who backed it most enthusiastically. Um, Angleton was interested in in was there a chemical? Was there a truth serum? You know, uh, uh, was there something that you could give to you know, a prisoner, uh, an agent to make them tell the truth. And, um, uh, you know, and that one of the drugs that they experimented with was LSD, which they knew had incredibly potent effects and they were trying to harness it. But that was, Angleton had a very, um, intellectually, a very, um, audacious, uh, creative thinker. Um, so he, he looked for every advantage in every scope of life, every aspect. And, and science and chemistry was just one of them. Yeah, he even he himself experimented with LSD, which I found surprising. Yeah. Um, and also that he was a friend with a, kind of a notorious KGB asset, Kim Philby. Can you talk a little bit about how that started, where that started, and how that affected? Yeah, well, when, so the, the United States had never had a foreign intelligence service before. We had an FBI uh, which had some overseas offices in Latin America, but we never had a intelligence service that went out to collect information on the enemy and send it back to the United States. Well, with the coming of World War II, President Roosevelt and uh, uh, a man named Bill Donovan uh, uh, knew that America needed an intelligence service if they were going to be fighting the Nazis in Europe. And so as the U.S. prepared to invade Europe, with the, the D-Day invasion in 1944, they were also setting up and organizing for the first time America's first foreign intelligence service, which was called the Office of Strategic Services. And um, the Office of Strategic Services was organized by professors from leading universities, 
the Ivy League and the big state universities. Um, and uh, they went looking for, uh, you know, the most qualified, intelligent men to work in this and this new entity, the OSS. And when they found them, they sent them off to train in England. England had had an intelligence service of one sort or of another for a couple hundred years because they had an enormous colonial empire um, and they needed to subjugate their native populations in order to maintain their colonial rules. So the British had a lot of intelligence experience and the Americans basically had none. So these bright young men were sent over to, to London for training and there the uh, senior officials in the British Secret Intelligence Service uh, known as SIS, or more commonly MI6, um, trained the Americans. And all of the names that you mentioned before, James Angleton, who would become the counterintelligence chief, William Colby, who would become a division chief and later director of the CIA, Richard Helms, chief of operations and later director of the CIA, all of these men went to the OSS training in, in England. And one of the trainers there was a man named Kim Philby. Kim Philby was a part of the British elite. He had gone to Cambridge. Um, he'd gone uh, to Eton, the exclusive prep school. Um, and he was a rising star in the British intelligence service, very intelligent man. And so he was one of the teachers of the Americans. And one of the Americans whom he liked the best was James Angleton. They were slightly eccentric characters, um, very wide ranging minds, curious, adventurous, and Angleton and Philby became fast friends. When the CIA was created in 1947, uh, Angleton was working there in the foreign intelligence branch. And in 1949, Philby came to the United States. He had been assigned to head the MI6 station in Washington, which was, of course, the most important intelligence station in the world for the British. They needed to have good relations with the Americans. And so when Angleton moved, when Philby moved to Washington in 1949, he resumed his friendship with Angleton. They had been close during the war. Then they, they had been separated. They'd gone on to do other things. Philby uh, uh, went to Turkey. Uh, Angleton um, uh, went to Italy. Uh, but they stayed in touch and they reunited in Washington in 1949. And they met regularly at the Harvey's restaurant. It was a, very exclusive restaurant in a big hotel right downtown Washington, just a couple blocks from the White House. And they were fast friends. Unfortunately for Angleton, Kim Philby was a Soviet spy all along, and everything Angleton told him was immediately relayed to the KGB in Moscow um, for a couple of years. Um, through a series of uh, counterintelligence investigations, mainly involving code breaking, the CIA finally figured out that there were Soviet spies in uh, Washington, and they called one of them in to, um, to interrogate a man named Donald McLean, who worked in the British embassy with Philby, and who was indeed a Soviet spy. Philby tipped off McLean, and McLean took off for the Soviet Union along with another employee of the embassy, a man named Guy Burgess. Well, Guy Burgess was Kim Philby's housemate. They had been classmates at Cambridge. And so when these two spies disappeared on the brink of being interrogated by the FBI on suspicion of Soviet spying, by fleeing, they basically admitted that they were guilty, and suspicion immediately turned to Philby. There was a third man, everybody said. And, you know, remember Orson... Orson Welles made a, a movie, a, a thriller called The Third Man. And it was made at this time, and it was that was a popular phrase. Who was the third man? Well, suspicion turned to Philby, and um, he was very artful. And he had left no fingerprints anywhere. And so he denied it. And he said, no, it wasn't, it wasn't me. The British investigated, and they couldn't prove it against him. And they liked Philby. And so they said, well... They just withdrew him from Washington, but they didn't charge him with anything. And they basically decided that the Americans were wrong. And that's what James Angleton decided, too, that Philby really hadn't been a spy, that the other two had been, but he really shouldn't be, you know, suspected. Right. And I think Philby, there was kind of an infamous public denial that was recorded. There's a tape of him just smiling and saying, I had nothing to do with that. So 
He kept yes. it. No, no. It, yeah, I mean, you can imagine this was, you know, we've had our own spy scandals in our time, Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen, you know, and, and the Kim Philby story was comparable. And there was a very famous time when the very composed, relaxed Kim Philby, you know, ex denied it all and explained to the TV cameras why it couldn't possibly be him. It's a brilliant, brilliant performance. Um, right. And he's uh, part of the Cambridge, well, it was Cambridge 4, Cambridge 5. Burgess yes, the, Soviet, the Soviets yeah. had, had, had recruited uh, a series of young men at Cambridge in the early 1930s, including Burgess, McLean, and Philby. So right. they, Philby was part of that group of a long-standing Soviet spy network in the United States. It wasn't until 1963 when uh, the British and the, the MI6 and the CIA received additional information from new defectors, which basically proved that Philby was a Soviet spy. So the British called him in again, hoping to, you know, get a confession. And uh, in January 1963, Philby took off. And next thing you know, he was in the uh, he was in Moscow. Moscow right. And this was a crushing, crushing blow to James Angleton, because not only had he been fooled by Philby once, but he had been fooled by him twice. Um, and they were personal friends. I mean, they, well, when Philby was in D.C., they were drinking together. They had a lot of boozy uh, experiences really and Bur Burgess as well. So it wasn't just professional. They were personal friends as well. No, no. And, 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 and I think that was part of what was crushing about it was it was not just a professional relationship. It was also a close personal uh, as well as professional relationship. So after 1963, Angleton goes downhill. Um, I mean, he becomes very paranoid. And you could imagine if, if you had gone through this experience, right, sure. you could never trust anyone again, you know, and Angleton never did. And he basically launched a witch hunt within the CIA looking for a, a Soviet mole, looking for another Kim Philby um, and uh, ruined a lot of careers with false suspicions. And um, uh, he, you know, he he. He eventually he lost power within the CIA because people stopped believing him and turned on him. His views were so extreme, so rigid, so paranoid. And so you have this brilliant man, uh, incredibly influential across a wide range of CIA operations. And yet he, you know, he, he really goes mad um, uh, uh, in a way um, and, and, and really loses it. And it's finally driven from power and exposed by a massive article by Seymour Hersh in the New York Times in, in late 1974. And Angleton, who had spent a life in secret, was really unknown and not even very well known within the CIA, was suddenly, you know, had TV cameras parked on his lawn in Arlington, Virginia, and was a household name and was called to testify. And so it was sort of a shocking fall for a man who had been considered one of the most brilliant American spies and one of the leading lights of the CIA. And that was, was that the church committee or was he, that the Rockefeller commission that involved Cheney uh, as well? Well, the, um, uh, as a result of Seymour Hersh's story and the firing of James Angleton, um, the Rockefeller commission was created, um, by, uh, by president Ford, um, who had just taken office. Um, but because the Rockefeller Commission was so stacked with establishment figures, it, it really didn't have a lot of credibility. And so uh, the Congress decided they needed to do their own investigation. And later that year, later in 1975, the Congress created the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Activities, which was headed by Senator Frank Church. And so that's how the Church Committee came into being. But it, was, it began with the exposure and the firing of Angleton. And that kind of led to kind of an unraveling of many of the CIA's misdeeds, including assassination plots, et cetera, that uh, were yeah, formally so, not disclosed. Right? Yeah. So, you know, um, that's exactly right, is for the first time, people outside the CIA were given a glimpse. The Senate investigators with security clearances were given a glimpse at CIA operations. And, you know, what they found was quite shocking to a lot of people. The assassination plots of at least three foreign leaders, uh, the MKUltra, the mind control things were exposed then. Um, 
the mass surveillance of U.S. citizens, right. the spying on the civil rights and the anti-war movement. Operation um, Chaos. So this domestic this, yes, th yes, thing this domestic that, that the UCA was not supposed to be involved in their founding charter in any domestic activities, right? Right. And so the modern the modern structure of, you know, that we know today and is still in the news today, this that the House and Senate have oversight committees that, you know, that look over the intelligence community's activities uh, and uh, review them so that there's some outside accountability that was created as a result of the church committee experience, which came out of Angleton's firing. Also, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts, the FISA courts, wow. which have figured in some of the controversies around the Trump-Russia investigation. Fascinating. The FISA courts were created in 1978. That what that meant the CIA couldn't just go spy on anybody they wanted. They had to go get permission from this court. And so the FISA courts are still in existence today. So the world of, of CIA uh, governance, if you will, of CIA accountability was created in the mid-1970s in response to the exposure of the type of things that James Angleton was involved in. And so, you know, it's not just a matter of history. You know, when, when Angleton was fired and the CIA was under fire and the Ford White House was trying to figure out how to protect the CIA and protect its secrets and limit the damage, the two officials who helped Ford the most with that were his chief of staff, Donald Rumsfeld, and his top assistant, Dick Cheney. So Rumsfeld and Cheney led the charge to protect the CIA at, from investigators in the 1970s. And of course, they would return in the second Bush administration to positions of even greater Great power. power. So there's a lot of continuity between the world that Angleton created and the world that we live in today. That's an excellent point. And I found it interesting the way that you broke this kind of conflict into two parties, the King's Party and the Constitutionalists. And I still think that that King's Party label applies to the activities of Cheney all the way through, really, from, from that day to the present. Absolutely. I, I got that terminology from the guy who, who was the staff director for the church committee. So very respected guy named Bill Miller. Um, and uh, who had worked in the State Department and really, you know, was very respected by all sides, had all the security clearances. And he developed that terminology that there was a, the King's Party, which said, you know, the president is the king. He can do whatever he wants. And we, we see some of that with Trump today, you know, uh, saying, you know, I can do whatever I want because I'm the president. And then the, the Constitutional Party, um, where people say, no, you know, we need to. If we're going to maintain trust, right. we need to follow a set of outside rules and hold ourselves accountable so that, you know, that we have the confidence of the government and the people in doing that. And you still have that tension today with, you know, uh, well, what can the intelligence committees get from the CIA? What can they get from the president? Can they get to see everything? You know, right. they, they're saying, you know, this is part of checks and balances. And you still have the King's Party saying, no, the president can do whatever he wants, you know, go away. Right. So. That, that conflict between the Constitutionalists and the King's Party is still with us as well. Amazing. It's such a fantastic book. I learned so much reading it, and it just filled out so many pieces of the puzzle, including JFK, his involvement, the fact that Angleton held the ownership of that file for four years and then kind of tinkered around, made sure nobody saw it. Yes, and, and I, yeah, I think, I think I, you know, if people are interested in the JFK story, the story of Angleton's handling of the Oswald file, I think, is one of the most remarkable stories. And there's no, again, once again, there, there's no theory here, okay? This is what happened. Nobody disputes what happened. The CIA never came out and said, you know, Morley's wrong in his book. Uh, I was working with CIA records and on the record interviews, there's no anonymous sources in my book. Every record is on, uh, every interview is on the record and recorded. Um, if people, you know, eventually want to hear it. So it's very well documented. And the story of how Angleton handled the Oswald file and how he covered up after the assassination is very interesting and very and, and it ties into your earlier book, Winston Scott, so you can see this web kind of ties into yes. uh, JFK, yeah. Oswald, Winston Scott, the cover-up. I forgot to mention another book, which I didn't see on Amazon, 
CIA and JFK, The Secret Assassination Files. Is that available at jeffersonmorley.com? Uh, that is um, only available in ebook form. Oh, okay, that's right. So you can get it on Amazon as a Kindle ebook. Okay. Um, it's not it's not a full blown narrative the way my other books are. It's what it is it, uh, is a collection of my JFK reporting, okay. um, kind of stitched together um, to look at very a, a series of CIA officers who were involved in the JFK story. Gotcha. Um, and. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a little more of a journalistic book than a, a, a full blown narrative. It's shorter, um, uh, and has it has a little more granular detail at sort of the lower levels of the CIA. Gotcha. Um, and so, so we're at about thirty minutes. Is there anything that you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Well, just um, uh, uh, people should visit my uh, website, jeffersonmorleybooks.com, uh, and they can order my books there. Uh, they can get signed books. They can communicate with me, ask me questions. So Great. that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. And that's Jeff, J-E-F-F-E-R-S-O-N-M-O-R-L-E-Y-B-O-O-K-S.com, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, Jefferson Morley, again, the title of the book is The Ghost, The Secret Life of CIA Spy Master. James Jesus Angleton, published 2017. Jefferson, thank you very much. Thank you, William. All right, have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.